Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to this lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, whom I've had the pleasure of working with closely for the last few years, as Liz uh, referred to it, through our mutual involvement in the Encyclopedia of Life, a project that Chris John spearheaded. Uh, Chris John Samper is the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., and one of the world's leading advocates for museums and contemporary society and an expert on environmental policy. Christian is well known to many of us in this part of Harvard's campus because he was a graduate student in organismic and evolutionary biology and received his PhD in 1992. More about that later. Christian is a native of Costa Rica, but he grew up and received his bachelor's degree in Colombia. He returned to Colombia after graduate school where he initially served as director of the Environment Division of the Foundation for Higher Education. Beginning with that appointment and continuing to the present day, Christian has accumulated a string of impressive titles and accomplishments. These include founder and first director of the Alexander von Humboldt Institute, the National Biodiversity Research Institute of Columbia. He was chief science advisor for biodiversity for the Colombian government and recipient of the National Medal of the Environment presented by the President of Colombia. He then he also was chairman of SUBSTA, which is the subsidiary body of scientific, technical, and technological advice of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, in which role Chris John helped develop a global strategy for plant conservation and launched the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which has come to fruit rather recently. Christon's association with the Smithsonian began as deputy director and staff scientist at STRI, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. In 2003, he was appointed director of the National Museum of Natural History, which maintains the largest natural history collection in the world and whose public exhibits attract more than six million visitors each year. Perhaps his greatest challenge came beginning in 2007 when he was appointed acting secretary of the entire Smithsonian. In this capacity, he dealt successfully with an irate US Congress, an embarrassed board of regents, and dispirited scientific staff to affect the transition to new permanent, and succeeded in affecting the transition to new permanent leadership the following year. Since then, he's continued to champion innovative programs for natural history museums, both in the US and abroad, and I guess because he was getting bored of and missing some really controversial and difficult positions, he was elected member of the Harvard Board of Overseers this past spring and started this summer. Now, all of that stuff you could get off any website, or at least the Smithsonian website. What you can't get is the information about Chris John we have in the MCZ. Because it turns out Chris John, who's now a, prof a botanist by training, started out actually in the MCZ as a zoologist. Um, as many of you know, we had unfortunately, very tragically, uh, one of our curators, Carl Lehm, the professor and, and curator in ichthyology, passed away of just a few months ago. But several months before Carl died, and even the fact before his illness was diagnosed, we were discussing this MCZ anniversary lecture series, and I mentioned that Chris John was going to be presenting. And, and Carl, as those of you know, always has a good story to tell. And it turns out that Carl told a story about Chris John as a beginning graduate student working in his lab, his lab, his fish lab. Now, um, those of you who knew Carl know that he had this incredible penchant and talent for recruiting students, whether they be undergraduates or graduate students, to sit in for long hours in his lab, staring at a fish tank, waiting for fish to do something, <laughs> anything. And Chris John was one of the students who was so recruited in this way. Now, you wouldn't think this is rocket science, but for whatever reason, Chris John was having trouble doing the job and wasn't gathering much data about these fish. Fortunately, upon the scene comes Beth Brainerd, a beginning graduate student, who's now quite an accomplished uh, bioma biomechanic on her own, a pro uh, distinguished professor at Brown University. And as Carl said, Beth fortunately came into the lab. She whipped everything into shape, and in fact, subsequently published with Carl and Chris John, a paper which I pulled up today, published in Science Magazine in 1989, Air Ventilation by Recoil Aspiration in Polyptorid Fishes by Elizabeth Brainerd, Carl Lehm, and Christian Samper. <laughs> Carl also pointed out, though, how lucky it was that Beth showed up and remarked that if Beth hadn't appeared on the scene, Chris John might still be there watching fish in his lab. 
Anyway, we're very pleased to have Chris John here tonight. No, there's no one better to, I think, discuss the role of museums in society and the future of museums, those pre-standing and universities. So Chris John, welcome. Title of your talk, everybody can see for you here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jim, for that embarrassing introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be back here. And as you point out, I, I was a, both a visiting undergraduate student here, which is when I worked with Carol. And then I came back for graduate school with Peter Ashton. I'm delighted that Peter's here tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us. There are a few other embarrassing stories out there, and including a photograph that I remember showed up in the Harvard Gazette, because the other person I worked with was uh, the late uh, um, well, I, I, uh, Taylor, Dick Taylor. And one of the issues we're working on, the other paper I published was on energetics of locomotions in kangaroos. And there's actually a picture of me walking a kangaroo on a leash in Harvard Yard. <laughs> so there's interesting moments, but then I discovered plants were easier to study. All right. Um, so uh, Jim invited me a few weeks ago to give uh, this lecture, a few months ago actually, about uh, Natural History Museums and to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the MCC. And he also sent me a copy of his presentation, which I missed and I haven't watched it, but I saw the PowerPoint. And I decided part of it inspired me to go back and do a little bit of uh, history, the relationship between the Smithsonian and the MCC. I'm going to cover that in a moment. But before I do that, let me just start by uh, sharing with you one of the images I have from my childhood. As was mentioned, I was actually raised in Colombia, in Bogota, Colombia, where I went to school. And I spent much, much of my time as a small kid cruising the mountains around Bogota. This is this plateau about 8,000 meters above sea level. And one of my favorite places on Earth to this day is going and climbing the mountains to this lake, which is known as Lake Guatavita. And it's just a wonderful place to go. I think that's probably where I started falling in place with nature. Uh, but this lake is very important in the, myth in the mythology of Colombia because this is the lake where, the, theoretically, the famous legend of El Dorado took place. And some of you are not familiar, but the other very striking image I have from my childhood growing up in Colombia was this. And this is a piece, a very well-known piece, from the Gold Museum in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, probably the single most important piece they have there. And it's the legend of El Dorado where, as we understand it, the Muisca people would go out on this lake and once a year present the ceremonies to the gods. They would cover themselves with gold, go out on this lake, and present all these incredible gold pieces to uh, the gods for their well-being. And this is a depiction uh, made by the Muiscas of the legend of El Dorado. But I was fortunate growing up in Bogota to have access to a museum. In this case, the Gold Museum run the bank, by the Banco de la República. And I think many of us early on in our childhood had an opportunity to be touched by a place like that and to have it show you part of your history and the world that you're at. But through this museum, which has a remarkable collection, about 40,000 gold pieces, uh, this is just one of the displays that you see there, um, it's really, in many ways, started my uh, first quest and intrigues with uh, museums. Of course, uh, many years later, uh, when I came here as a visiting undergraduate in 1985, I ended up here, right outside this building. And uh, this was indeed a place where I spent much of that year when I was a young undergraduate coming from Columbia to Harvard, which is a very intimidating experience by itself. And it was here in those basements where I walked with Carol Leem in the midst of the fish collection to try and find the polypterid fishes. Uh, but it was a, just a, a really good experience. But then I discovered, of course, going upstairs, I discovered the glass flowers. And it's just another of those remarkable collections that uh, to this day continues to inspire me and has inspired many, many people. And of course, I never thought, having been here and having been a graduate student and going back to Columbia, uh, that I then end up closing the loop and 10 years later coming back to the U.S. Uh, to the Smithsonian and to the National Museum of Natural History. All of this to say that I've had multiple intersections with museums in different capacities. As a young boy growing up in Colombia, as a student here using the collections for some of the research science, 
and then now running one of the largest museums in the world. So a lot of my talk will come, uh, what I want to do is analyze a little bit about the history of these museums, the intersections, the evolution of this idea of natural history museums in society, and what I think are some of those turning points, some of those thresholds moments when these museums have changed. And I'm going to refer not only to natural history museums per se, but the broader museum movement, uh, mostly in the US, with some references to what was going on in Europe. And then toward the end of it, I want to talk a little bit about the future of the museums and some of the things I see happening right now, but also the kinds of things we're looking at at the Smithsonian as to where we see this going on in the next 40 or 50 years. So let's just start with a little bit of the history. This is from Jim Hankins' talk, uh, which he sent me, and of course the MCC uh, back when it was uh, built. And as I mentioned before, it was interesting to read a little bit. I'd always heard a little bit of the history here, Louis Agassiz and the uh, foundations and the beginning of this great collection that we're celebrating today. But I, what I didn't realize as much was the intersections and tensions that existed historically between Louis Agassiz and the Smithsonian Institution. And of course, this is also a quote from Jim's talk, but uh, Louis Agassiz, as many of you know, and I don't want to cover all, uh, all of the points he made, but he was very much inspired by the idea of having a great museum here founded, which will equal the great museums of the old world. And a good tradition very much linked as well with the academic institutions, in this case, Harvard University. And that was very much the vision of Agassiz. But as many of you know, of course, um, Agassiz was an interesting character from what we've read historically and uh, did ruffled a few feathers along the way. But the other players, what may not be as obvious is that the time that Agassiz was here and the MCC was started, there were other very important players and very other important things happening here in the United States of America related to museums. And two of the key players, and this is where our lives intersect 150 years later, being here, but the two other key players were Joseph Henry, who's on the left, and Spencer Baird. Now, Joseph Henry was the first secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. He was a physicist. He was a professor at what's now Princeton. And he was recruited to be the first director in 1846. Um, he was the kind of projects that he was involved with included establishing a network of observations to record the, na the weather uh, around the country and basically laid the foundation for what is now the Weather Service. And Spencer Baird was his uh, young assistant who came, uh, who started with him and would later become the second secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Now there was a tension between these two characters right here in that Joseph Henry, when he was beginning the Smithsonian Institution, they read the bequest of James Smithson. No one knew what the Smithsonian was supposed to be because the bequest of Smithson stated that the Smithsonian was supposed to be an institution devoted to the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And the act of Congress that created replicated that mission. And the question is, what is that? Is it an academy of science? Is it a university? Is it a collection? Is it a museum? And interestingly, Joseph Henry was completely against the idea of having collections. And the reason he was against it, he figured that the budget would, and the bequest of Smithson would never be enough to pay for the upkeep of the collections. As it turns out, um, Joseph Henry had a very close and positive relationship with Louis Agassiz. And what I didn't know until I was preparing this lecture is that Louis Agassiz was a member of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution at the same time. And the relation between the two was great respect. Of course, Louis Agassiz was a tremendous figure in the United States at that time, widely respected for what he was doing here, including the establishment of the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And Sp Spencer Baird was a young guy who was uh, committed, fascinated by nature, collecting these pieces and really trying to pull them together. And uh, Joseph Henry and Spencer Baird had that tension down the road, as you'll see later, uh, it was Spencer Baird that really shaped the Smithsonian as the great collection that it is today. And these two men were building what was at that point another of the great institutions, the great museums here, and it started here, the story with the building of the Smithsonian Castle. This is the oldest building in the National Mall, but I can guarantee you it doesn't look this pretty now, but the building is still there. And of course, this was when it was created, it was created as the U.S. National Museum to pull together many of this collection, the collections of this young nation 
to try and uh, display, uh, bring together some of the minds and later on display some of the collections. And these included not only museum specimens, but some live things. So they actually go and bring some of the bison and park them behind the Smithsonian Castle. These were later on moved up Rock Creek Park to what's now the National Zoo in Washington, the Zoological Park. But also inside the art, what was at that point the castle, they set up these incredible systematic collections uh, that started gathering many materials, including, and very importantly, as I'll come back to later, the materials of the U.S. Exploring Expedition that brought many of the marine collections here uh, to the United States. But there were some interesting um, tensions and relationships between Baird and Agassiz. Um, and I've got a few excerpts from a few letters. Uh, this is a letter from Agassiz to Baird in which he was actually commenting on the quality of the work that Baird was doing and his commitment to the Smithsonian. So he said, it's not easy for me to trust to paper what I have to say to you, there being seldom a remedy to misapprehensions for writing. I will have, if you will, however, remember that nothing but sincere interest, if you could prompt me to write, my note may not be useless. From beginning, I have looked to the Smithsonian Institution as the greatest foundation for the promotion of science in this country, and I have lost no opportunity for securing the election of such an assistant in the Department of Natural History as a new competent to advance such a noble cause. Your paper, uh, Batrachians, has satisfied me to have that you have the requisite uh, qualifications. But then he goes on to say, but what shall I say about your catalog of serpents? It's true that it discloses great industry by the extensive collection you brought together from the remotest parts of the country, and this will always be very credible to you. But the scientific part of the work is very crude, and I should never expect that while you are connected with the Smithsonian Institution, such a volume would be issued with its sanction, and still less that your name should appear on its title page. To tell you the truth of my impression, I do not believe you had much to do with it, and I hope sincerely for the sake of your scientific reputation that it turned out to be so. Not only that, as you start to see the tensions, as it turns out, one part of the grudge that was going on here is that Baird had recruited one of the assistants of the Museum of Comparative Zoology to the Smithsonian, and someone that apparently Agassiz did not have in the highest esteem, because he goes on to say, if you had been willing to listen to my advice before you should have known that Gerard, though capable of sustained work and endowed with considerable ability in distinguishing the peculiarities of animals, has no judgment and is utterly unable to trace original researchers without supervision. Moreover, he is obstinate as a mule, if contradicted, which makes it necessary that he should be led with a high hand and kept in an entirely subordinate position. And this, this tension goes on, uh, but Baird was always very deferential uh, to Agassiz as his elder, as the figure that he was at that time. And Baird responds to Agassiz and says, my dear professor, I'm exceedingly indebted to you for the frankness with which you have ex uh, criticized the Serbian catalog. And so far from being offended, I'm grateful for your interest, which prompts you to go into discussion of the various points involved. And he goes on to do this. And actually, later on in this letter, Baird says, corrects him, pushes back and saying, by the way, all that catalog, I personally reviewed a lot of the materials, but we may disagree on this. So this was the kind of dialogue that was going on between the Museum of Comparative Zoology and, Har and uh, the Smithsonian around uh, this time. But as I mentioned, the, at this point, Baird was the junior and the assistant to Joseph Henry. And in the diaries of Joseph Henry in 1873, we find a few references to his conversation with Agassiz. I'm just going to read three of them. Said, had this morning a long conversation with Professor Agassiz on the subject of the Smithsonian Museum. He informed me that the Zoological Museum of Cambridge has expended last year $56,000, and they're connected with it in all 28 persons. And then he goes on to describe what they are and how, much liter, how many liters of alcohol they use for the collections here. But then the interesting thing, it actually goes on to express Agassiz's views of what the Smithsonian should be. And he says he thinks that the Smithsonian and the Cambridge Museums ought not to duplicate specimens, that each should have its special object, that the aim of the Smithsonian is to the preservation of everything American, especially serial specimens of these categories. And he informs me that as the Smithsonian has the largest collection of, bears, uh, of birds and Professor Baird is the first in line in ornithology, he has not made no collections in that line and goes on to these issues. But you really see at the end this, these notes, and it says, the desire of the professors to make the museum at Cambridge 
and that of Washington supplementary to each other, that each be supported by Congress. Uh, my, as my business is to guard the interests of the Smithsonian, I need not take part in this matter. I rejoice, however, when Congress makes any application for science and would be glad to see both museums supported with adequate funds. I have no idea how this will turn out. And of course, nowadays, 150 years later, I leave it up to you to decide where both institutions were. Probably none of us got enough funds, as many as we wanted. But shortly after this dialogue happened, of course, uh, Baird was appointed the second secretary of the Smithsonian. One of the first things he did was really work on building what's now known as the Arts and Industries Building, which is a building right beside the castle that was built to house all of the major collections of the United States right of the, after the Centennial Fair and brought a remarkable collection to the point that this was the largest museum building that had ever been constructed in America. And it was thought to be big enough to contain all knowledge that existed about the country. Now, the building now is actually empty, and we're trying to figure out exactly what to do with it. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful building, completely dysfunctional for a lot of the uh, elements that we have right now. But it was a monumental building at its time when it opened in 1881. And of course, later on, uh, even that building proved some of its limitations, and that led to the construction of what is now the National Museum of Natural History, which opened its doors in 1910, March 17, 1910, so almost 100 years ago. And this was uh, the time when they were completing it. And I can't help but notice the dress code for the engineers has changed a little bit. <laughs> but this kind of relationship, I mean, it shows you the kind of dialogue and a little bit of what was going on in America. And this relationship, which uh, existed between uh, Harvard and the Museum of Comparative Zoology and the Smithsonian. And of course, with time, 163 years later, the Smithsonian's grown to the, be this complex of now 19 different museums. We're starting to build a 20th museum. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable set of collections. It's the largest uh, collection of objects anywhere in the world. And one of the things that I like and that inspires me every day when I go to work is, of course, the statement that it makes of a nation like the United States of America that everything between the Capitol and the White House is right there. The entire National Mall is lined by museums. And I think it's an important statement of this relatively young nation when it was redesigned by L'Enfant in terms of making and making a statement about the importance of museums to uh, the country. And it's not only about the Smithsonian, but what happened in the 19th century, in particular in the 20th century, in the United States of America was an extraordinary explosion of museums. Museums that nowadays number more than 17,000 museums in the United States alone, that host more than 900 million visitors every year, and that really have become, in all of its forms, different manifestations of the country, the expressions, and the culture. Now, about of those 17,500 museums, about half of them are historical museums and societies, many of them fairly small. About one third of them are art museums, and less than 10% of them are science, nature, and children's museums in those categories. But for the rest of this talk, what I want to focus on is the issue of the evolution of the idea of the natural history museums, and how it happened, how it started, and how it has evolved. And this would take a long time, but I'm just going to focus on five points that I think were major transitions. And of course, many of the early collections of the origins of the idea were linked to the specimens that we have uh, in the collections, both here and any of these museums. Not only a few specimens, but of course, huge numbers of these specimens. In our case, nowadays, 126 million specimens. And collections that are used to generate new knowledge, to generate science. And of course, something uniquely American and very important was the issue of the exhibitions and opening these museums to the public. And I'll come back to that in a second. But there are all kinds of museums. There are university museums. There's public museums. There are nature centers. There are science museums. So they, when we talk about a museum, it's all kinds of issues. But officially, it is a museum as a building or institution that's dedicated to the acquisition, conservation, study, exhibition, and educational interpretation of objects having scientific, historical, cultural, or artistic value. 
But we didn't get to these museums overnight. And the beginning of this story, of course, starts in Europe primarily with what were known at that time really the cabinets of curiosities. And this was one of the first cabinets of curiosities in Italy in the 1600s. And we're looking, these were remarkable collections done by individual people that were out there, people like James Smithson, who would go out there, collect all of these strange things from wherever, and pile them together in a place with no particular systematic collection. But it was the issue of bringing them together from that individual collection. Now, of course, later on, as the great, uh, during the Age of Enlightenment, and as some of these collections started to grow, and the conceptual elements evolved when we started having people uh, the, in France, some of the great museums are happening, and very importantly in the United Kingdom. We really started not only getting these individual cabinets of curiosities, but we started pulling them together and arranging them in a much more systematic manner. And this led not only to museums here, but to many of the great museums in Europe. And many of them became these temples of knowledge, if you wish, and the collections like the Natural History Museum in London uh, nowadays with its remarkable collections. But then, and then that's sort of at that point when these great museums and this boom, the museums in Europe had gone through this process of going from cabinets of curiosities to systematic collections. And that was the inspiration for someone like Agassiz to do the elements here. And it became the, new, the innovation of a place like the MCC, as you know, was really looking at the comparative elements between these collections. It was not just the description and the systematic collection of these, but the comparison of these to get new truths about nature and the way it worked. Right around this time, of course, came a major phase of, if you wish, the exploration. Because around this time, when these museums were being built, we're looking at the time right after Humboldt and the journeys of Humboldt to South America, and many of the journeys that were bringing things back. And this is one of the paintings from uh, Church from the Andes, from the expeditions. And this was done right around the time of the opening of the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And many of the people here were being inspired. This was the vision of the nature that was out there. And people were intrigued, were fascinated by what was going out there. And we saw renaissance and a major period of expeditions that were organized by the museums in North America and by other government expeditions. Of course, we had Lewis and Clark. But a little bit later on, the famous US exploring expedition of 1838. And this was one of the first major systematic explorations organized by the United States around the world to document the oceans, the peoples, and bring back all this knowledge. And the collections from the US Exploring Ex Expedition, which is also known as the Wilkes Ex Expedition, would come back to an institution like the Smithsonian and be made available for people for their study. And this area of exploration would go on with the expeditions that were done by the MCC, um, also by people at Roosevelt. And this was one of the famous expeditions. This was the expedition of Roosevelt to Africa after he was president, in which he actually collected a number of specimens for the American Museum of Natural History in New York and for the uh, Smithsonian as well. But it was not only uh, right around this time, it was not only about going out there and collecting all these things, but you see a paradigm shift that started in Europe and came here and reached its max maximum peak with some of the collections that we saw at places like the American Museum of New York about trying not only to have the collection, but to represent that collection in its natural setting. And this is where the dioramas in natural history absolutely take <coughs> off. And you see that it's not only about having the specimen, it's about trying to replicate the conditions of that specimen and creating the illusion that you can transport new museum visitor out there into these areas. And that led that this was, for many of the people in this country, the first opportunity to glance at some of these elements of nature and to really transport them to all kinds of ecosystems that were out there and be captivated by the nature. And this is a very important difference at this point, this inflection point of view ish, between what was happening in Europe and what was really happening here in North America, and that these museums in of natural history in America were really set up as very democratic institutions that were largely, in many of the cases of the museums like the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh and others, to bring for the public and to share this knowledge with the public. The next major inflection point, I think, really happened in the last century when it was not only about displaying the elements, 
but really when the science and the teaching of science and the interactivity of the museums came together. And of course, this is a photograph of the Exploratorium in San Francisco, where Oppenheimer and some of the other people were really inventing a new face in some of the museums and what we were doing here. And it was really about taking this old hangar, putting science there, bringing people in, bringing children, and letting them do the science so they could learn by themselves. And this is when the explosion of the concept of the hands-on, the science museums, the children's museums, and all of these took off in this country in the last century. And many of the elements that we've seen there are now finding themselves coming into the natural history museums to look at hands-on learning opportunities for these children. The major change here was not only the issue of, instead of having a passive display, engaging the visitor with what we're looking at and engaging the questions, but the other fundamental change when the children's museums and some of the others started happening here, it stopped being about something and focused on someone. It was a shift from the content into the audience. And that was a very important shift in terms of who you're trying to attract into this area. And I think many of the elements that are happening there, as you know, the Boston Museum of Science was one of the major players in this arena, and many other museums. And the different natural history museums have been to a greater or lesser extent, being bringing in some of the elements. But as you'll see, it's certainly one of the things that has come into the Smithsonian the Natural History Museum to this day and in the last 50 years. But then there's one more important change that has happened in this country with many of the museums, especially in the last 30 years. And it's a phenomenon that may be fairly obvious out there, but I think most of the museum, natural history museums have been fairly oblivious to it which is what, oh, sorry, what, I forgot this, which is the new technologies. This is an image from the Science and the Sphere which, in the Ocean Hall of Natural History, which is very much the kind of interactive technologies that you can actually bring in classroom, interact with them, and let them look and explore the systems in the ocean out there. But the last major element or inflection point I want to mention is what I would define, for lack of a better term, the cultural pluralism. The explosion of the ethnic-centric museums, the reinterpretation of the American history, and the expression of different local and national cultures and their claim for identity. And of course, one of these manifestations was the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian. We're now building an African-American History and Culture Museum. But there's a whole set of these museums addressing particular segments of the population, particular audiences, and trying to highlight their role in uh, our society. And this really took off around the time of the bicentennial of the country. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that there's a whole string unfolding in these cultural museums about the relationship between these people and nature and natural history. And they're, much, they're absorbing a number of elements of nature and the interpretation of nature faster that natural histories are having this dialogue. And it's created interesting tensions, even within institutions like the Smithsonian, between the Natural History Museum and the National Museum of the American Indian. Many of you have seen this building, which is a stunning construction, opened four years ago at the National Mall. The building itself makes a remarkable statement about the landscape and the materials and what the native peoples are. But this is a museum that was designed by the Amer Native American people for the Native American people and the American population. And it is very much their voice. And if you go around the area, in all of the gardens around it, you see that it is all about the natural history, the plants, and the uses of the plants by the peoples and the Native peoples. So there's a whole string of elements of natural history that we're seeing in these cultural museums and how we get some of these elements uh, embedded and how we build some of the interactions between these cultural museums and the natural history museums is something where I think a lot of the work remains ahead. And of course, you take it to the extreme with multiple interpretations and the, abs and the explosion of Frank Gehry museums all over the world in various capacities. And what you see is the museums are, again, becoming an iconic art piece by themselves. We see that budgets are being, being spent on these, and they're very much becoming a destination and it's quite remarkable to see what has happened in the last couple of decades. But it's been an idea. The point is that where we are today, it's been an evolution of an idea over the several hundred years that may have started with the cabinets of curiosities that chained into the systematic collections that were organized at places like the MCC, 
that went through a phase of expeditions, the building of national museums and the building of dioramas, and into the hands-on science and the culture of pluralism. And now I want to shift for the last part of my talk into a little bit of some of the elements I see about the future. Not only about where we are, where we got to today, but what are some of the main drivers and some of the changes I see happening right now and where we might be heading. Of course, when you think about those inflection points and some of the elements you see there, there are a number of key drivers in this change, both in Europe and in North America. And I should say as well, in many parts of the world, because some of the biggest changes that are happening right now in the museum landscape are not in the United States of America, but they're in some developing countries. So you go to places like China, and I was just discussing with one of our colleagues here today about what's happening in China, which is quite remarkable. There are over 400 different museums being built right now. Uh, many of them uh, you would not necessarily classify as a museum and that they don't even have a collection and they're crossing lines with entertainment. Uh, Abu Dhabi alone in the United Arab Emirates, there are 80 museums and cultural centers being built right now. So there's an explosion happening in many of these developing countries, much more so than here. What you see, I, I'd say there are sort of five main drivers of the change in the evolution of these natural history museums. First, of course, is an idea centered around the evolution in our thinking and our concepts. When you think about the impact of Darwin and the theory of natural selection and evolution and the way we completely reorganize the presentation, interpretation, and use of collections, those were major shifts in the way we're looking at. We're looking at uh, the whole issue of uh, genomics or plate tectonics or many other elements that have really shaped the way that we think about the natural world. These have both driven the agenda, the collections, and the interpretations in these museums. The second major driver, there's no doubt, is the cultural change that's happening in society. Uh, going back 200 years with the whole uh, process of the early establishment, but today, these, eth these cultural pluralism museums, the various ethnic museums, the mix and the changing demographics in our society are pushing these museums to new frontiers and new areas and will pose interesting opportunities and challenges for natural history museums. There's no doubt that technologies are opening new tools, both for research, but also for display. And they're also having a major point in shifting the museums away from just being a destination, but connecting out there. But a very important one is the, the whole role of globalization. Uh, this is something that's definitely shaping the way we look at the museums, the way what we collect here. You can see that the increasing connection of North America with the world, starting with the Wilkins expedition all the way to today, has, shaped, has played a major role shaping not only the collections and the ability to bring these collections here, but it's playing a major role in the impact of these museums around the world. And the last issue, of course, is funding. And that's non-trivial with the, with the histories of these various museums. Fortunately, the Museum of Comparative Zoology and the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History have had, with different models, relatively stable funding. But if you follow the stories of what's happening across the United States of America right now, there's a major crisis in the funding for these natural history museums that is leading to closing a number of university museums and also state museums, partly because I think in many cases, they failed to make the connection of what these museums mean to society. And I think what you're looking at is a, is a change, a fundamental shift in the way that these museums are operating, confronting issues to a greater or lesser extent. And I'd say there are five big changes. The first one that we already discussed before is shifting away from just being descriptive collections of the things in an area into really looking at the concepts and the interpretation and the comparison. So it's not just having one butterfly of everything that's here. It's doing comparative studies to understand biogeography and evolution and using the collections to present concepts like evolution. The second one is not just collecting stuff, but connecting the stuff. So it's not the paradigm has shifted away from these great museums where all the pieces were come to London and Paris and Harvard and Washington, and we'd have these concentrations of people, and that's where the expertise related. Nowadays, because of capacity, communications, and others, it is about building capacity in these countries. And the real paradigm is how we connect the Smithsonian with the museums in China, Abu Dhabi, and other places in addressing fundamental questions. That, of course, links to the change that's happened that many of these museums grew in relative isolation 
both even within institutions like the Smithsonian, but really shifting into a much more collaborative mode. But another very important shift that I think is happening, and I think is going to be increasingly important in the next decade or two, is the shift away from seeing the museum be a destination, a place you come to, into having the museums really become, for lack of a better term, hubs of knowledge in the society. One of the very interesting facts, if you look at the pulse in society, in American society today, is museums are the most trusted source of information in society, more than schools and more than almost anything else. There's a sense of credibility of the real thing and the authority of a museum, not only at Harvard, but really out there. And it's an issue of how we connect, how we connect with the schools, how we connect with the universities, how we connect with the various players. And it's not just an issue of being a place to come, it's becoming a player in that broader society, whether it's a local museum or whether it's a global museum. And that brings me to the last point, which is clearly with globalization and with new technologies, the incredible power of connecting a local museum with the world is incredible and reaching people. Not only are people coming from all over the world to see you, you are connecting with many people around the world. And the kinds of content, the kinds of research, and the kinds of exhibitions that we can do are changing dramatically and will be a major shaping force in the way we interpret and collect going forward. And let me just show you a few examples of the kinds of things, what these changes are meaning for the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. One of the projects we've been working on with the Mellon Foundation relates to digitizing the specimens in our herbariums. These are high resolution images from just two of the grasses that are in our collections. And these are extremely high resolution images. So there are about 256 megabytes per image. And I can't do it right now, but you can not only put these out on the web, but you can drill down and zoom in to a point that you can look at the structure and the seeds of one of these grasses. And this can be put out there systematically so anyone out there can do it. And we have now done this with more than 100,000 different type specimens in our herbarium are up there on the web for free for anyone anywhere in the world. This has had two or three very important consequences. One is the number of loans of the type specimens has decreased by 95%. So most of the people who we have to loan these specimens are no longer requesting them. It's much better for the specimens. But two, the citation, the number of citations using these specimens we're finding has increased 20 to 30 times just by putting the specimens up. And it's an opportunity. The, uh, the other important issue is that Museums like Harvard and museums like the Smithsonian have many of the best collections anywhere in the world. One of the ironies I've always found, having grown up in Colombia, is that the second largest collection of biodiversity of Colombia is on the National Mall of the United States. And most of the people, like myself, growing up in a country like Colombia, have not had access to that collection. The only way you could do it is by coming to Washington, which was not always easy. So I think it's going to level the playing field in terms of empowering people to become active players. And it empowers us to put the collections of a place like the Smithsonian or the MCC at the fingertips of someone out there. It will never replace the real thing, but it will really empower people to ask many good questions. And it's not only about the specimens, but it's connecting these. Because in the case of the herbariums, we're right now working with 140 different herbarium in Latin America and about 90 in Africa, to digitize all of the type specimens. And this is being funded by the Mellon Foundation. And the point is, within five years, we have the possibility, maybe even three years, of having every single type specimen in every herbarium, every major herbarium in the world, digitized, available online, and connected instantly. This is something that we could not have done five or 10 years ago. And we can integrate the data points as well. And one of the important steps in this that many of you are familiar with is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility as a gateway to the knowledge and the collections. But this is just a few, to, a few of the collections that are there. But this represents 171 million individual records with locations of particular species that are out there. And with the information technology we have, it's not only making it available, but how we can use that information to ask questions about patterns, distributions, biogeography, invasive species, and a lot of tools that, are, that we can do now. And not only can we do them here, we can make sure that people around the world can do these. And it's not only, of course, in the case of our collections as to looking at connecting the information, but it's also ask, using the collections to ask new questions. 
And of course, DNA has been a very good example where we can go back at the collections and extract DNA from tens of thousands of years ago and actually use it in reconstructing phylogenies. But it's also about using specimens from the fossil record. And this is just one example, one slide from one of my colleagues in natural history, Scott Wing. And uh, what you see here, I'll have to explain it, but his specialty is he is studying the rainforest of Wyoming 55 million years ago. And what happens is we know that there were massive moments in the history of this planet when there were important fluctuations in climate change. And we know that entire biological communities shifted in their distribution ranges to respond to some of these changes. And Scott has, been has found an incredible section that he's been studying and publishing where he's been documenting the change from a temperate flora into a tropical flora and back to a temperate flora, flora and looking at which were the groups that went extinct. And you can actually use this to try and correlate and interpret the impacts of climate change, not only now, but reconstructing, looking at the past for addressing contemporary issues. I think this is another very important issue, looking at how we use the, connection, the collections that we have to address some of the key issues, not only in basic knowledge, but in some of the fundamental issues that society is dealing with, be it public health, be it invasive species, be it climate change. And I want to finish this loop of the 150 years back to the Encyclopedia of Life that Jim mentioned, and he mentioned it as well. But this is an interesting project. Of course, Ed Wilson and many other people have been champions of this idea for a long time. But the good news is it's happening now. And it's been happening, and I'm very happy to say that we're working on this together between the Museum of Comparative Zoology, the Smithsonian, and about 25 other institutions around the world. And the important thing is we're looking at really integrating the knowledge. And it's a new way of reaching audiences with the knowledge, with the collections at these museums. And it's not only about pushing content out, but it's about getting content in. And one of the things that we're working on now and that we hope to be rolling out is really activating and empowering people to develop what we call the citizen science element. This has been done by the bird community and the Christmas counts for a long time, but can we really mobilize tens of thousands of people to not only use data, but contribute data? And can we design new insights into nature and some of the things that are happening right now with these tools? Just to give you one example. If you're interested in the impacts of climate change, in the rates of distribution of invasive species that are showing up and crippling some of the native species here, you could use a tool like the Encyclopedia of Life to provide the content and engage school children all over, up and down the eastern coast of the United States, and have tens of thousands of simultaneous observations to look at the flowering times, the distribution ranges, the relative abundances of some of these species, and mobilize it in ways that no NSF grant could ever pay for. And of course, the last point I want to make here is really about not only the information we have and what we can collaborate as museums, but how we can connect with other institutions out there. And this is just one set of institutions that all happen to be interested or tied to biodiversity information. And then if I add public health and I add agriculture, I couldn't fit the logos. But the issue is getting the museums to think beyond just the museums and our purposes inward looking, but looking at how we connect what we do with the other players and the other users that are out there in society. And I think there, the great potential is doing this. Having said that, collaborations are uh, expensive and uh, time consuming. So looking at the future, the way we're looking at it in terms of the Smithsonian and the next two decades, I think we're looking at five key elements that are going to drive a lot of things that we're doing just to wrap up. First is adopting new technologies that will allow us to store the collections, to digitize the collections, to ask new questions with the collections, but also to share the information that we have with new audiences. And I've shown you several examples. The second very important issue for us is reaching out to different kinds of audiences. The visions not only were really making an effort to shift away from looking at the museum as a destination where we'll have 7 million people come, but how we take the museum to every single classroom across America. And why not to connect it real time with China or Abu Dhabi or Colombia? And this is an opportunity, something we can do now that we could not have done some years ago, and we can do it interestingly. And it's not about putting just the content out, but seeing what those audiences need and how they need it and when they need it. This is going to require a particular set of skills that most of our museums don't have at this time. 
The next issue, of course, is building partnerships. It's building the partnerships within the Smithsonian, but it's building the partnerships with other institutions out there. And some of these partnerships are going to be not with your traditional partners, but with the less conventional partners. And I think the fourth dimension we're looking at is how we really cross boundaries. Because the key issue is not only looking at natural history for the sake of our science, but how we tie what we do with different sectors out there. And I see Eric Chivians here in the first row, and uh, we've spent some time together. But of course, Eric has written this wonderful book in Sustaining Life, which is a really good example about how we can use biodiversity and the impacts and the livelihoods and the human well-being and, and the health of people. And I think it's how we can use these these museums, the connections, the exhibitions that we have, and connect with issues like public health or national security. One of the main partners that we work with right now is the Department of Defense. Uh, when you see things like uh, the plane in the Hudson, uh, guess who, who identified the birds that are there? There was this collections at the National Museum of Natural History. And because we went back to the collections, we could actually tell you not only that it was Canada geese, but we could actually tell you which population of Canada geese was, it was, and whether it was migratory or not, and what the flying routes were. And that information is being done by the Federal Aviation Administration to retrace the flight routes of flights in the United States and improving safety. So examples like that of connecting the basic science with key issues out there are great opportunities in crossing the boundaries and thinking beyond our immediate peers and our comfort zones. And that's the last point, which is without becoming an applied research institution, which is what we're not, we're not the Agricultural Research Service, how we show our relevance to society. In the in case of someone like MCC, of course, it's a university museum. There is a role for teaching. But I would argue to you today that museums like the MCC and the Herbarium and the Harvard University Natural History Museums have a responsibility of connecting with the rest of the university and doing it in unconventional ways. I hope that there's some of this that is happening. I hope we can look at building partnerships with us. But I think the success and the power and the growth of these museums going forward is really going to be about responding to some of these drivers of change. So we've come a long ways. This was, I walked in that door this morning. And the landscape was slightly different. But that was the Constitution Avenue entrance of the National Museum of Natural History. The building's still there. Uh, many of the collections are the same. But the questions that we're asking, the people are coming in the door, and the way that we're displaying these things has changed dramatically. But in the end, we, it's not only about looking at the way things were. This was the original Hall of Extinct Monsters when the museum opened in 1909. And this is what's there right now, the Sand Ocean Hall. A different display, a different set of technologies, a different way to reach to audiences. But you know what? The real thing is still there. It is what makes a museum what it is. It's the connection. It's the real object. It's that specimen. And the way we interpret it and connect it to various people that will make a big impact. And I think all of us will loop back, and everyone in this room, I invite you to loop back and think about what was your raft. This was the one object that's in my mind from when I was seven years old that got me in the journey of museums. And millions of Americans that come to natural history still come back remembering something that they saw with their parents or their grandparents. And they come back to look at those objects and look, reinterpret them and looking at how they can use museums and collections to improve their lives and to help us understand where society is going. Thank you very much.